The Conflict Kitchen developed uh, with Dawn Waleski, who's my uh, partner in the project. She now lives in, in California, but she was working with me, and we have our, the side of our uh, waffle shop has its own little storefront, and that's where our kitchen is. And literally, we were challenged by the hip-hop restaurant. He had a hot dog guy selling food outside, and he said, and I was like, you know, that's preventing people from coming in our waffle shop. You do the booze, we do the food. He's like, come on, man, you're a fake business. Why don't you compete? <laughs> you know, so I was like, that's it. You laid it down, we're going to compete. And we decided we'll open a restaurant, but obviously we're not going to sell waffles because that's the thing that brings people in for the show. What would we do if we could create a, rest a takeout restaurant in, in Pittsburgh? And we started off with what was missing from Pittsburgh and all the things I described originally. And so how can we be all of those things at once? How can we every restaurant that's never existed? How can we be a center for political discussion? How can we create um, presence for cultures and ethnic groups that no one's paying attention to or that have small populations within our city? Um, and how can we do it in a, in a way that's really, truly engaging? So we created the Conflict Kitchen. Essentially, what you're looking at is a facade that's just stuck onto the building. We got around any permitting because um, it sits off the ground a little bit. So if you, if you were on the ground, you've got to get a permit. If you go out into the public right away a certain amount of space, you've got to get a permit. We, everything unfolds or folds out and then folds down. Um, and basically, we're running two restaurants out of one kitchen. So we're competing with ourselves, which again is like an irrational business strategy. The other strategy, I mean, a lot of people, it's funny because we were talking now that it's kind of moved through the internet. There's like a Russian uh, social entrepreneurship group that has approached us several times about, like, can you present to our social entrepreneur group in Russia? And I'm like, I, what? I, we've, we stumbled upon the whole strategy. When we presented this to people, no one liked the idea. No one wanted to give us any money because you're going to sell food that has no market in Pittsburgh. It's not a pizza joint. It's not, you know, whatever. You're going to ask people to talk about politics with strangers in the public space. Americans hate that. And as soon as someone gets used to it, you're going to go out of business and change to another restaurant that does the same thing. So there are like three bad business model ideas, which have all turned out to be good business model ideas. Um, and maybe if we weren't artists, if we were entrepreneurs, we would never have gotten to this point. So the very first version was an Iranian one. Obviously, the visuals are really quite important, right? It has to be striking. It has to get people. We want it to be anomalous to the landscape, to the visual landscape of the city. We also want to privilege the Farsi over the English. Um, we're the on, we were the only Persian restaurant the city has had. Um, we worked with, uh, with local Iranians as well as folks in Iran. I have many friends I've developed over the years and other projects who are living in Iran. You know, the impetus at the time, which was uh, almost four years ago, was looking at the, the rhetoric within media that was very similar to the build-up to the Iraq War, right? Cases were being made, um, and a very simplified discourse was being put out. And I have friends there where the discourse is complicated. I mean, if we all talked about even Obama at this moment, none of us would agree exactly, right? It's not about simplification. We were thinking, can we create a place that actually complicates people's perspective? Um, and can we sell really, really good food as the seduction towards that. It's just, can we bypass ideology with just hunger? And, and can we engage people on a daily basis? And you know, can we not just be a fly-by-night pop-up? We're not a pop-up. We're a restaurant that's been in the city for three years. We were a pop-up the first week, and the first month became less of a pop-up. This pop-up kind of thing to me sometimes is kind of irritating because it implies a lack of real depth and commitment. And it implies also that we know what we're doing. We're going to pop up and tell it to you. What we're doing is we're creating a space for co-education, co-learning our, between ourselves and everyone else who comes to us in the city. Um, and to do that, you've got to be around. You have to have a, a call and response system, not just a, you know, an iterative system. So the idea was let's use the food. Let's have the food also be a mechanism for carrying information, right? So obviously food is an incredible storytelling device in and of itself. The food comes wrapped in interviews that we did with Iranians, again, on a variety of cultural and political topics, often contradicting each other, as we are like to do. Um, folks who've never had Persian food 
you know, might just think, oh, this is kind of like a weird cuisine, and that could be a great way to start. But then they might think, oh, what does this relate to the culture and cuisines of either, you know, my community or my city? Um, this space, the space that opens up when you're waiting, when you're ordering, right? This is a kind of the same performative space as the talk show in some capacity, a little bit more open-ended, um, but also more focused in terms of the nature of the conversation. Our idea was to be That's fine. disruptive, to not, to have people come with a question. Like, how do you get people to come with a question, to create a space of curiosity that they're initially like, what is this place? It looks weird to me. And then fill that space. That's a really fertile environment, right? That curiosity. And too much curiosity, total befuddlement, you don't get anything. And, and if it's too normal, you have no one caring. That space doesn't get opened up. So when that space gets opened up, it gets filled by our staff, who are really just expert conversationalists. They're not experts on any one of the given topics. They're cultural junkies. They're political junkies. They're following the information. But they're just trying to catalyze that moment between them and the customer. And they're not, you know, to me, the worst thing is you can just sort of spout your own ideologies and shut down a conversation. So this is our, our Afghan version of the project. Um, after about five or six months, we switch. This is the Venezuelan version. Um, this is a recent trip to Cuba where now we have a full-time chef who's amazing, um, cooking in homes, cooking in local restaurants, interviewing folks. I won't go into great depth. This is the North Korean embassy, so we knew we wanted to do a North Korean version. This was the closest we could get. We rang the doorbell, literally, and an a, uh, attache came out, talked to us for 45 minutes. I'll go over that a little bit later. Um, so we opened the Cuban version of the project. Um, so the food is one level. There's also projects and events that we do. So we take a table like this. We take a much larger projection screen. Um, on the screen is um, a space in Tehran. So it's a Pittsburgh Tehran dinner party in which on their side, they're eating. They've pushed their table up against the space. And essentially, we're sharing this another version of the meal. This is in Pittsburgh. This is in Tehran. Uh, we're all cooking the same Persian recipes. Ironically, we made our small from scratch, and my friend Sarah bought it all at the store. <laughs> a lot of canned stuff, um, which was part of the conversation, right? The, at that time, the second time we did it, the sanctions, the second level of serious sanctions were in place. Um, to cook from scratch was actually more expensive than to, to buy from the store. Um, similar events we've done with Afghan filmmakers. We do cultural festivals, um, school groups are coming in. We've used the billboard as a way of catalyzing conversation. Is that line for you or for the hip-hop buzz? The line was for us. That was our <laughs> event. Yeah, so we had, yeah, right. Um, a paladar, so, you know, while we were down for a little bit looking for a new location, we basically just functioned out of someone's home. Um, and then we've recently, a year ago, moved to probably the most central spot in the city, which is the Shenley Plaza. It's right between the University of Pittsburgh, Carnegie Mellon, across from the um, Carnegie Main Library. And um, we've gone from having 30 to 50 people at the old location a day to having, during a summertime, we'd have two to 300 people. Um, changes the nature of what we do, and it's had to make us be more nimble about how we can actually engage with folks. Um, what it's accelerated is our capacity. Number one, it's a full kitchen. Um, we make a lot more food. We have this built-in audience of, you know, folks who are just hanging out during lunch every day. And, you know, we're open from 11 to 6, so that audience kind of changes. Um, as a publishing venue, it's probably been the most remarkable thing. We've accidentally discovered that we're a great publishing venue. People really read the rappers. They read, there's a North Korean cookbook. Um, there's other materials that we hand out, and that space you have during lunchtime to you kind of put aside, maybe you'll be on your phone, but you might read something, actually works for us. Um, so that's kind of one of the ways in which we, we storytell. And, and you know, I know there's a Center for you know, Rethinking Documentary here, and I, all of my work is fundamentally nonfiction, but it's I very <laughs> early on recognized how nonfiction is a completely constructed and playful genre. So in that realm, this is a project that we do called The Foreigner. 
So you come to eat, and we say, hey, would you like to have your Persian meal with uh, Saurabh? He's living in Iran right now. And you can um, have lunch with him around the corner through a human avatar, who is our employee, Elise. <laughs> so Elise just sits around the corner, and in her headphones, she has Saurabh live. Simple, right? Saurabh is live. Anything Saurabh says, she just automatically repeats. And the customer, the customer has a little microphone, so Sorab hears directly what the customer says. So Elise is basically this empty vessel. <laughs> but she's also a, a hyper-local human body. She's someone you recognize. She's someone who looks familiar. She's someone you've seen in the window if you've come to the restaurant before. And this, to me, is the metaphor for the project in general. Right? Is this, number one, trying to create a simultaneity of place, of being here and there, of being us and them. Um, and, and also, like, how do you, you know, these stories that Sir Robert is telling, you can, sure, you could do it on Skype and talk to him directly. But how do you make people pay attention again? You know, I mean, what actually makes things uncanny in life? So that, to me, the fundamental artistic impulse is to make what's familiar unfamiliar so that we're in the present moment again. This in some capacity both takes you out of the present because you don't know where you're located but also brings you into the present and it complicates um, identity which you know he's a man she's a woman sometimes we have older people doing it younger people um, so these are just some customers a lot of times I'll pilot and try these projects out um, in other cities. So I tried this out in Cleveland, in, in the public library and in the shopping mall. These are the human avatars for these uh, Iranians throughout public space. So these happen in different ways where folks would just approach you and say, hey, you know, what's, what's, the, what's life like here right now? A totally confused person, you know, a fish out of water that then slowly realize that they're not here, even though they seem to be here. Um, we did a similar thing at the San Diego Museum in the Persian Gallery where you meet, you're told to find this woman who's a local and she is an avatar for our friend Sorab who runs an art space in Tehran. So you're in a gallery filled of ancient Persian works and he's in a gallery of contemporary art. So you have the juxtaposition of the space, of the work and of the individual kind of happening. Uh, another project that got piloted outside of the restaurant and brought back was uh, Dawn and I were invited to be part of a biennial in, in Puerto Alegre, Brazil. So I'll walk you through the project. It happens in this main city square, park rather, um, and there's a lake. And so when you walk up to the lake, there's these signs that tell you that you can take uh, free rides with Barack Obama or Hugo Chavez. And, um, and then there's this series of speeches that will happen over the next five weeks. As people line up to sign up to take these rides, which are swan boats, already pre-existing, um, we made our own version of the sign where you could take a free ride with Chavez or Obama. And then we hired... <laughs> and then we hired actors... <laughs> we hired actors who played uh, Chavez or Obama. And, I, you know, very quickly, because this is a very huge project, you know, Brazil, you could see in terms of... Right. Venezuelan socialist policies have been very influential throughout Latin America, let alone Brazil. Uh, but, the, you know, the IMF is perhaps the most embedded partner Brazil has. So, you know, United States and, and Venezuela uh, present very interesting polls. But also Chavez and, and Obama are these very romantic figures that people project their irrational hatred and love on. Very polarizing. Um, and so we thought, well, these will be great kind of devices to elicit stories from the Brazilian public. So what happens is you're invited to take a ride, and during the ride, uh, Obama, like a lover, would say, what do you think of me? And after a little while, you know. And the public would say everything they really thought of him. You know? and, and maybe they break up at the end or they fall in love, I don't know. And the same with Chavez. So he would come up, and the way they would work is they'd come up to you on the dock, like, would you like to take a ride? <laughs> um, and this, this issue of seduction is something Catherine and I have talked about. You know, how do you seduce people into something that's maybe didactic in some capacity, or political, or ideological, or, you know, problematic? Um, so you take the ride, and he records what you're saying. So 
uh, then those recordings are taken verbatim, scripted. Uh, and the scripts become the speeches that the politicians give <laughs> every afternoon. So here you can see on these floating platforms, there's Obama and there's Chavez. Throughout the park, there's speakers. So um, during the two to three hours that they're giving this speech, you'll come up to the park and you'll hear Chavez giving a speech. They're in Portuguese. Or you'll hear Obama in Portuguese giving a speech. Sometimes they overlap the speeches. And the speeches are filled with um, first-person opinion, right? But the uh, president embodies them. He presents them as if they're his viewpoints. And what you get is a politician who says what you want him to say, <laughs> who's really self-critical or self-aggrandizing or actually factually incorrect about himself. Um, or actually a lot of things talk about Brazil, you know, and via Obama, who's a very powerful individual. Uh, so the romance is then turned into politics, um, is turned into documentary, is turned into storytelling. So <laughs> both of these guys were in a play about Michael Jackson at the time. <laughs> um, so, okay, so we've done versions of this at Conflict Kitchen. We've done, and I've got stuff that can hand out. We published something called the Iranian Speech, and the Iranian speech is a speech that's crowdsourced by, from Iranians. We asked Iranians, um, what would you like to hear Barack Obama say? Give us part of a speech, write part of a speech. Then we compile that speech and hire a local Barack Obama Im imitator um, to give the speech to the public that's just gathering outside of Conflict Kitchen. Um, we've subsequently also done a Cuban speech, which I think we have some versions of here. Uh, so we've published the speech and then another version, and this time, we decided we could get a much larger audience through our social um, media, which has become pretty large at this point. So we hired the number one Barack Obama Im imitator in the world. He lives in LA, his name's Ron. He has this studio, next. his kitchen is right behind the flag. <laughs> and, um, and we gave him the speech and then we disseminated it through public media. I'll play a little bit. Can we turn that up? Yeah, absolutely. That's okay. For their future generations. Uh, well, rebuilt by its citizens, a country respected by the international community, or will it be known as a country destroyed at the whim of the elite and powerful? We cannot remain silent for fear that we might so these are of international So the thoughts of actual Cubans. Across Cuba, a slogan is heard. Cuba will change if we want it to. We must support the people's will to change their country. Uh, I actually forget the last time I had anything to say about Cuba. <laughs> <laughs> we like to talk a lot about defending human rights. But then we have trade and have close ties to China and Vietnam and Russia. We have Cuba 90 miles from us, and yet we have forgotten all about it. Americans, we care more about things that happen far away than close to our shore. I'll just jump around a little bit. Today, the United States reaches out a hand to your citizens, but not they don't even see him. I really think they want to be capitalists at heart. Now, there is a Cuban woman I know in Miami that never worked a day in her life, and she gets Social Security. And I with uh, Vietnam, and Vietnam is a communist country. We have even established negotiations with North Korea, and now with Syria. And those are countries that have openly <coughs> opposed and sometimes fought against the United Cuban public's lack of information, with the aim of connecting citizens all over the world. The Cuban government has persecuted civil society. So you can see it's a schizophrenic speech. It's, it's filled with, with pro and anti-Castro, you know, people for different types of policy, um, and, uh, you know, there's a simple construct that we're using so that the voices don't become simplified. You know, we, we want to get a debate out there. We don't, we want to, in, uh, you know, it's sort of, people talk about metrics a lot. We're not really into metrics. We're into encouraging curiosity. Now, what we could say, how do we measure whether curiosity has been encouraged? As artists, I feel like I've got a good sense if we're engaging curiosity or not. And we're always trying to experiment, like, is this interesting enough? Am I going to want to engage with it? So other byproducts of the 
this is an individual project I did at the city of Columbus next to their state house. It's a live uh, time and temperature from Tehran um, is played in Columbus. Um, again, this idea of simultaneity of space. Uh, we do something called the, the lunch hour. This is a, a local Syrian doctor who's been giving um, support to uh, rebels in Syria, uh, a way to, so now we have folks who come to us every day like, hey, you're going to do a Syrian version, or you're going to do an Egyptian version, um, a Czech version, um, and our chance to kind of move a little quicker is to have these weekly lunches. Um, our current version is focused around North Korea. Obviously, this is the, the hardest one to research. Um, I was in Shanghai. The closest I could get to North Korea is a state-run restaurant by the North Korean government. They actually have in several countries which is really like a Chuck E. Cheese meets Shangri-La version of North Korea. Incredibly bizarre, and you can't really record anything. And there's a stage show, and the William Tell Overture happens in the middle of it, and it's, it's really disturbing and disconcerting. But what we did was we actually, we are now working on a project with North Korean defectors in um, Anyang, which is a city south of Seoul. And um, our research was to go there initially to interview folks, to cook, to hang out with the, the defector community. To go into North Korea, you can go, but it's a very controlled experience. Um, so the recipes all come out of those direct experiences, and they're brought back um, to our venue. Sometimes we've done an event, this is an event for 250 people, where if you sit on the right side of the table, you're getting a South Korean dish. And if you sit on the left side, you're getting a North Korean dish. So there's the arbitrary differentiation and separation that's given. But, you know, one of the things that you learn is that, you know, this is a, you know, Korea has been one Korea for thousands of years. The, the politics of 60 years doesn't really create a culinary separation, although the politics of food in Korea is based on what is accessible. You know, so Koreans are, North Koreans are only eating meat, you know, two or three times a year. So we're by default a vegetarian restaurant at this time. Um, one of the other events I was telling Griff about um, that we, we're doing, now that we are having this sort of international uh, following, is a cooking lesson. Uh, this is using kind of like Google Hangout. This is just Skype, like a premiere account, where you can get 10 videos up. And we have um, the North Korean chef that we've been working with is giving a lesson in Seoul to nine other people who are in different cities. And the way we do it is everyone, uh, first you sign up for it, right? And if you're in Buenos Aires, we give you the recipe, the ingredients to shop for. And that's one of the interesting challenges, right, is to, you got to get your local version of what you could find in North Korea. Even in Seoul, they have to get the local version of what they could find in the North. And then, um, and then we all cook together. And the greatest part was when we're all, like, grating potatoes. It's like an orchestra. Um, so I'll show you. I think I have a little clip. So my name is John Rubin, and um, I'm the co-director. So everyone introduce. So after introduction, we go into you cooking. You put in the radishes and the stock and let it stay there for a while. The water is quite boiling, so you might want to keep your fire up. Okay. And you want to mix them together. Oh, Okay, yours look great too. Thank you. So this is how our pancakes look like. So that is what how our Eastern eat. And then the younger people can start eating. And then we just sit down and eat, have a conversation together. Um, one of the nice things about this, you know, as you guys, since you're involved in technology, I'm sure you've done a lot of Skype. You know, Skype is tough when you have a group, because there's one person at a time. This, because everyone is doing an action, you know, and you're not just sort of like all paying attention. You can, the conversation was much more organic and casual. So someone was like, soy sauce, do you, you, you know, is there a specific way in which you use soy sauce or you do not use soy sauce? Is it fish sauce and soy sauce? And you're kind of just asking a functional question within your recipe that then oftentimes organically flows into perhaps even a political question. Um, so I'm going to end with, I added these, so just to talk about this bizarre way in which the project has hit a kind of cultural zeitgeist and the portals in which people enter or become aware of it. The biggest one is through the food, is through the kind of foodie movement um, that's going on. And, and I can't say I'm barely a foodie. 
Griff's a foodie. We hire people who are really amazing foodies. But um, the second one would be actually through tourism. I forgot to mention that. So we've become a tourist destination. Visit Pittsburgh, which is our main tourist bureau, mostly because we got attention beforehand, now has us on the tour of alternative spaces in Pittsburgh. So people are always coming by from other countries. Then there's the news outlets um, that are interested in it. Um, and then the international attention, which is frankly way more than the, the national. People who are asking us to do franchises on a weekly basis, majority of them are in like South Africa, in New Zealand, in, um, in Warsaw. Um, so the, the perception folks have of us from the outside is often that we're way better than we are in the inside. I always feel like we're never fully actualized. I mean, we could be a much better project. Um, and we could be more engaging. We could figure out more creative solutions to how the, our city, our first constituent, our customers, um, can become more curious and informed citizens. Um, and I hope that we're starting to create a civic impact. And the thing about Pittsburgh is it's so small. Everyone in the city knows about us. If I say Conflict Kitchen, people know about it. And we have, I feel like in that way, we've been able to shift the identity of the city itself. And it's also people love the story. This bizarre thing in Pittsburgh, you know, <laughs> that to them is a narrative. And I totally embrace that cognitive dissonance that, seem, that people seem to have about Pittsburgh having this really, you know, incredible culture project. Um, the other important thing is that we're open seven days a week. We're like the hardware store. We're like the, the grocery. We're like any other business. We, um, you know, we've got a revenue, we've got bills to pay, um, and we think about economics as much as anyone else, and it's not for free. It's not just a fancy art project. We're a business. We're struggling and trying to survive as, along with all the other businesses, and I think that gives us a type of credibility to our customers who are also interested in our kind of non-business ideas. So I'm going to end with maybe one of the most bizarre media. Yeah, if we can pull up the sound. I was in Italy recently, and I was giving a presentation, and my friend called me up after the presentation, and he said, did you know that you're on Italy's national game show? Um, and I said, no, I did not know that. And then we found it online. <laughs> A Pittsburgh ha aperto il <laughs> Kitchen, un ristorante dove le coppie possono litigare liberamente. <laughs> 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 questo Conflict Kitchen. Ma di che si tratta, Laura? Esiste, esiste. Il Conflict Kitchen di Pittsburgh è un ristorante che prepara piatti provenienti soltanto da tutti quei paesi con cui gli Stati Uniti sono in conflitto. L'idea è di attirare i clienti con del buon cibo per poi coinvolgere in eventi o dibattiti mirati a stimolare proprio la conoscenza della cultura e della politica di alcuni stati come per esempio l'Iran, l'Iraq, Cuba, Venezuela e la Corea del Nord. Bene, grazie. <ride> so. Like, you can't hire Valente to, do, to be your spokesmodel, right? <laughs>